Hello all, this is Tad and I am uh, here once again uh, with this week's Sunday School lesson. Uh, we'll be uh, continuing on in the book of 1 Peter. We will be in 1 Peter chapter 2 this morning. The passage that is in your lesson is uh, verses 4 through 15, but let me just tell you there is a ton in this passage and it could go on and on and on if we did all of that. So what I'm going to do is shorten that from 4 to 15 to 4 to 13, um, excuse me, 4 to 12, and honestly, um, it may get a little crazy as we go on through here, but we'll just kind of see where we go. And of course, you guys will continue to talk about that and discuss it uh, in your groups as you're doing that. Or, you know, just uh, feel free to, to write to me to contact as well. Um, now, just to remind you of where we were as we've been going through First Peter, we've looked at the hope that we have in the world. First Peter being a book that was written to people who he calls uh, aliens and strangers in the world, meaning that you and I as believers are a different people here in the world, and we are supposed to be different than those those that are around us, we're actually called to be holy because the one that we're following is holy. And so last week we looked at kind of the expression of this holiness and in, in how we live in the world and how we are to be holy in this world and how we're to, uh, to show the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And this week what we're going to look is uh, look at is basically how, how we speak uh, that testimony of hope in the world is, is how the, the lesson uh, lays it out. Uh, I don't know, the terminology there may be a little janky, but we're just going to kind of look at the passage and see where it leads us. Um, so if you have your Bible with you, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to be looking through verses 4 through 13. I'm going to go ahead and start with us, and we're going to spend some time looking at verses 4 and 5. So if you want to read with me here, I've got the New American Standard. Bible. I don't know why I pulled that out besides my regular Bible, that translation I read, but it'll do for us today, and it's probably going to be uh, very good for us. So let's look at that, verses 4 and 5 of 1 Peter chapter 2. It says, And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, this passage, it leads into uh, where we get to this place about coming to Jesus, um, uh, coming to him as a living stone. Uh, what precedes this are a couple of verses that essentially tell us uh, that first we, we come to Christ as newborn babies and that we are yearning for milk and that the milk that we need and that we need to live and that we need to come to Christ is the, um, is the word of, of God. And so, and then it comes to him and then we taste the kindness of the Lord. And as we're coming to him in his word and we're listening for him, this this is where we're going. And it, uh, let's look for a moment at this word saying the living stone. Now, if you think about stones, we don't typically think about them as things that are alive, right? <laughs> it's a stone for Pete's sakes. It's a rock. It's not going to grow. It's not going to uh, have a time where it, where it lives and passes away. It is just a stone. It's an inanimate object that doesn't have life. And so we see this, this thing that appears to be contradictory where it says that Christ is our living stone, right? Which has been rejected. And what we see here is this, um, this uh, metaphor that's being used for Christ is that not only is he strong for us, but he's also alive. And that as believers, we're going to perpetually be coming to Christ right throughout our lives. And ultimately, other people in this world and those that are around us will be coming to Christ as well for life and for strength. He is the living stone, right? And so it says, And coming to him is the living stone who has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. Now, there are certain people in this world who will reject Christ. That's the choice that each of us have to make, that everyone in this world must make, is one day will they choose Christ or will they reject Christ? Now, uh, it sets a contrast here because it says that he has been rejected by men, but is choice and is precious in the sight of God. And so uh, what it does, it sets at odds those people who have come to Christ and rejected him versus God. Now, the word choice here in this translation is actually the word elect. And what we see, uh, if we read it that way, it says has been rejected by men, but is elect and precious in the sight of God, that ultimately the one who is elect by God is Jesus Christ, and those who come to him are also elect in themselves, right? So, so those who come to him are elect, and he is the one who is precious in the sight of God. Now, he, he, he moves on here, and he, he speaks to the believers. He says, you also as living stones. Now, just just uh, pay attention to what's happened here because first we see that Jesus Christ is the living stone and that those who come to him, right, will have life, right, as, as they believe in him. But we see that those who come to him 
are now living stones. You also as living stones. So believers are not just believers, but whenever we follow Jesus, we take on the likeness, right? And, and we, we begin to do this, this process of becoming holy like Jesus, right? We looked at this a little bit last week as we talked about be holy as I am holy. And so believers are also living stones, right? And, and if you have your stone, what you're trying to do is, is you're trying to build something in this analogy with the stones. So it says you also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. So, so what we see here is that us as believers are being built up as a house. Now, now this is all of us together. We're not separate individuals, but rather we're stronger together as we build up a house of believers. Uh, just imagine for a second if you were building a new home or perhaps you're building a deer stand or a Lego house with your kids or a, a millennial falcon or whatever it is right, that you're doing and you're building these things. You could take one Lego or one piece of wood and you could say, this is my toy that I have here. This is my, this is my new home. It's this piece of wood that I have, or this is the, the, the one brick, right, that goes into the house, but this is all that I have, and this is plenty enough for me to call it a house. Well, that, that's not true, right? It absolutely is not true, and that's the picture, is that what we see here is that all of the stones, these living stones, are being built together, right? This is what we would call as the church, and we're being built together for a very specific purpose and to be a very specific people, and that is this. Let's, re let's continue on. We're being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. Now, here's the incredible thing about Christianity, and here's the incredible thing about our faith, is that individually, you and I are priest, right? Uh, now, the doctrine, we tend to get this wrong, and, and you may have heard the, the doctrine, the priesthood of the believer. Well, the, the, the actual doctrine is known as the priesthood of all believers, right? Which mean that all believers are a part of this priesthood, meaning that you and I don't have to go to some priest or some rabbi or some, some person who is above us so that we can have connection to the Father, but rather through Jesus Christ, each of us on our own can go to the Father. Now, the problem that we have nowadays is that some people have taken this, this doctrine to its nth degree and, take, and they take it further than where Scripture intends. And what, they, what, the, what we've done with this doctrine is we've removed the priesthood of all believers to the priesthood of the believer, making it an individualistic thing. But remember, we're all stones that are being built up together as a house, right, for a holy priesthood, meaning this, is that the, the priesthood is, uh, well, the problem is what, what happens nowadays is, and, and it's happened in, in the past as well, is that we say, well, if I'm my own priest, then I can create God in my own image, right? And I can make God choose, right? I can choose what, what part of God's rules and, and law I want to follow and what part I don't want to follow. What part do I want to believe and what part do I not want to believe instead of saying, no, this is what God says. And since I'm a part of his people, I'm going to follow him. See, and it's, it's when we're all together in this priesthood that that works. And so let's move on because he tells us why is the priesthood, uh, why, why are we being built up into this priesthood? Well, and he goes on, he tells us, he says, uh, for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. See, well, we're not being built up as a priesthood of believers so that we can do whatever it is that we would want to do, so that, so that we can do, right, so that we can reinvent Christianity in our own will or in our own while, in our own um, eyes, but rather so that we can offer spiritual sacrifices to God. This is why we're priests. Now, the sacrifices that we can make, right, uh, just think about it. A prayer. Prayer is a sacrifice that we're offering up to God where we're saying, Lord, speak to me, right? I want to speak to you. Uh, another thing that, that we offer up is uh, is our compassion, right, for one another and our compassion for this world, right? We're, we're holding that up. If we're offering up our lives to him, ultimately. We're sacrificing all that we are, we're giving of our possessions all for the name and for the glory of God. And so and what we see here is that rather than being a very individualistic thing, right, where the priesthood of the believer is something where you can't correct me because I know, right, what, what, I, what God has said to me, rather we're priests so that we can sacrifice everything to God, right? It's not a prideful thing where we say that I am a priest, right? But rather it is a humility thing where we say we're priests and we have given up 
everything for the cause and the sake of Jesus Christ. We offer it to him through the acceptable sacrifice of Jesus Christ, through his blood and his death on the cross and his resurrection. We're now living stones, a holy priesthood, who are offering up our lives to the Lord, right? And you can think about that with the priests of the Old Testament and how, right, they weren't these people who ran around doing what they all, what, what all they, they wanted to do, but rather they were a people who were communing with God based on his rules and his law and his direction. And so we're to be that same kind of people. For this is contained in scripture. So look at verse six through 10 with me. For this is contained in scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. Um, now, if we'll just stop there and we'll continue on reading for a second, because what Peter does here is he goes back to the, the metaphor that he's using of the living stone that is Jesus and the living stone that are Jesus's followers. And what he says here is, and we're not going to go into the nth of all of this, there's so much here that we could unpack, but we need to, to look at this verse. And it's interesting, this, this verse also appears in Romans chapter 9 at the very end. Uh, that kind of helps, I believe, to, to help us understand what Romans chapter 9 is speaking of. But he says this, he says, Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. What he's saying is this, he says, Jesus Christ is the living stone, and those of us who believe in him will not be disappointed. Those of us who believe in him will have no reason to be ashamed. Those of us who believe in him have a hope, not only in this world, but also in the world to come, also in the future, that we have a hope in Jesus Christ, and we will not be disappointed. He is our salvation. He is our strength, and he is our life. Now, continuing on here, he says, this precious value then is for you who believe. For those who believe, we have a living stone. Moving on, but for those who don't believe, right now, all of us, like we said, we have a choice to make in this world. Will you believe or will you not believe? You have that choice. You have that option, right? For those who believe, they will not be disappointed. They will not be put to shame. But now we're going to look at for those who don't believe. For those who don't believe, the stone which the builder rejected, this became the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For those who don't believe, Jesus Christ will become a stumbling stone. He will become the stone that leads ultimately to their destruction. Uh, let me continue on. For they stumble because they're disobedient to the word, and to this doom they were also appointed. Because of the rejection of Jesus Christ, those who don't believe are led to disappointment, and ultimately those who don't believe are led to doom, right? It's been predestined since the foundation of the world, right? That if you believe in Jesus Christ, then you will have life and you will have it abundantly. And if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you will have death and you'll have doom as it goes on. This is what was appointed. Now look with, now there, there's something interesting here because and when we need to point it out and I'm thankful I looked at my at my notes here because what we need to see is that there's hope here, right? There, there's hope. It's not a thing where some people are chosen to believe and some people are chosen not to believe, right? There's hope in this world. Let's continue on as we look at it. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And this is what this great hope is for our world. As we look around into our world and we see where things are chaotic and it seems to be dark and it seems to be a place where, where everything is just going off on its own rails. We have hope in this world that people who once were not God's people can one day be God's people. See, as you read into 2 Peter, you see that God's not willing that any would perish, right? And so he sent his son Jesus Christ to this world because he loved them. And his son Jesus Christ died in this world to pay the ransom and to pay the price for their sin. And so we have this great hope in the world is that God is not only able to save people, but rather he is willing to save people. And that in this salvation, people are not only, right, 
the people in their salvation do not remain the same, but rather people can change. And they can change through the life-giving work of the Holy Spirit that works in our heart as we believe and follow Jesus Christ. And that when we believe and we follow Jesus Christ, we become a new creation. Look, he says, we were a people who were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And if you have difficulty believing this, then you need have right then uh, this change that can happen in people's lives. Then you can look. You don't have to look any further than yourself, because there's one time in your life, right, where you were not a person of God. But since He's come into your life and you've asked Him to be your Lord, you are now a new person, right? You were at one time, you had not received mercy, but now when you believed in him, you have received mercy. And if this is a true action that can happen in your life, can we not have the hope that this is a true action that can happen in our world, where we see a world that is lost and desperate and in need of a savior, and they're feeling in so many things for comfort and for salvation, but can they not also turn to the one true living God and his son Jesus Christ and see their lives changed. If it was true for you and if it's true for me, then it has the possibility to be true for any other person in this world that anyone who turns their heart to Jesus can be saved. Someone who is not God's people can become God's people. Someone who had no mercy can have God's mercy. See, there is hope for change in this world. And now it moves on because it's going to give us this idea of what you and me as followers, people who are, have become living stones, people who have become God's people, people who live with hope in this world, then what is our action, right? And so let's look at it in verse 11. So he says, beloved, I urge you. Uh, this word urging here, it's uh, somewhat translated as conversation, right? But he's, right, it's, uh, it's an invitation is what it is. He's saying, brothers and sisters, I invite you to do something for me. He says, brothers, um, sorry, let me look. Beloved, I urge you as aliens, as strangers, right? I urge you as people who are different in this world, people who, who uh, holy and righteous people who are living in a lost and sinful world, I urge you to abstain from the fleshly lust which wage war against the soul. And what he's saying here is this. He says, look, you're living in this world, right? But you're not to be a part of this world. And what a great temptation that is for us, right? Where we look around and we see, well, what's, what's the point, right? Why should I be separate? Why should I abstain from certain things? Why should I have a different standard of living? Why should I have a different morality? Well, it's because what would happen is that we would look, ruin our witness. And we're going to see where, uh, where this goes here in just a moment, right? But we need to look at ourselves as strangers and remember that we're not true citizens of this world, but rather we live here, right? That we're walking beside the people of this world, but we're not walking among the people of this world. And so let's continue on with it as he goes on. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from the fleshly lust which wage war against the soul. Now, I'm sorry, I keep pausing on this verse, but like I said, it's just so rich. What is being waged war on here? What's being waged war is not the body, right? It's not, right, things, right, where uh, it looks like someone's going to die in a war, but rather the battle. And this is very important for us to remember and to notice the battle is not for the body, but the battle is for the soul. One day your body will pass away. One day my body will pass away, but the soul will remain. Now, one day we'll get glorified bodies when Jesus Christ comes back, but the battle today is for the soul. And so as we live and as we function in this world and as we try to exist in this world that is so different from us, we must remember that the battle is for your soul. And the battle is for the soul of your neighbor and for your children and for your parents and for everyone that is around you. If you like them, if you don't like them, it doesn't matter. The battle is being waged over the soul. Verse 12, so keep a behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Uh, What does this word excellent mean? There are other translations just to throw it out there. It it says keep a beautiful behavior amongst the Gentiles. It means to keep an honest behavior amongst the Gentiles. It means to keep your behavior virtuous 
against the Gentiles of this world, against this world that doesn't believe, keeping a beautiful, honest, virtuous, and excellent behavior, a behavior that stands opposed to the rest of this world. And um, it's incredible as we look. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of your visitation. I'm sorry, I've got a book here that I want to, I've got a, a passage that I want to read to you, and let me flip to it as, as we go here. This is, uh, this is the, uh, the, pre, the Pilgrim Priesthood. It's a book, uh, it's a commentary on 1 Peter uh, that is written by, um, by Paige Patterson. Um, and he is. There's a quote in here uh, about the Anabaptists that I want to read. But but I want to point this out as we as we look at this again, is that keep your behavior excellent, so that in the things in which they slander you as evildoers. Now, isn't this crazy, right? Well, you and I are supposed to have an excellent behavior, right? A virtuous behavior, so that when this world looks at us, right, that the things that they slander us on are going to be our behavior. Right? And so it's important for us, right, so that the things that they slander us on, the, the ways that they speak about us, are in actuality good things. Now, um, let, let, me, um, let me read you this passage about the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists are our, um, I, I guess you could probably call them our spiritual cousins. If you think about the Reformation, we, we normally think about three branches of the Reformation. Uh, the Lutherans, the, the Calvinists, or the Presbyterians, um, and then we think about the Anglicans, right? But there's actually a fourth uh, called the Radical Reformers, and the Anabaptists would fall into that category. Some of them were crazy. Others of them are very close to it, to how we would believe. Uh, and so let's just look at this writing uh, about the Anabaptists, where it says this. It says, those who unite with them will by their ministers be received into their church by rebaptism and repentance and newness of life. They henceforth lead their lives under the semblance of quiet spiritual conduct. They denounce covetousness, pride, profanity, the lewd conversation and immorality of the world, the drinking and the gluttony. In fine, their hypocrisy is great and manifold. Now, just notice for a second what is being written about these Anabaptist believers, right, during the Reformation, and what's being said about them in the negative, right? It's in the negative. It says they lead their lives under a semblance of quiet spiritual conduct. He's saying that as I look at their lives, I see that they're acting like they're in quiet spiritual conduct. He's saying these people are being way too spiritual, right? They denounce covetedness. They denounce pride, profanity, lewd conversation, and immorality of the world. He says they're denouncing all of these things, right? They're drinking the gluttony. And fine, what, what, are, they, what are they being called? Because this is how they live their life. This is how the world is seeing them. He says, and fine, their hypocrisy hypocrisy is great, right? Isn't it crazy that here's someone who sees these people living in a world, right, trying to abstain from immorality, and what are they being called? Not people who are trying their best to follow Jesus, but rather they're being called hypocrites. You know, um, I can just think in modern politics, and, and I try not to be political on these things, but it's just a, an example that comes in, uh, that comes in fresh in my mind, and it doesn't matter to me if you vote one way or the other, as long as you're you know, you're praying through it and, and, and Jesus is leading you there. Um, but but uh, just remember a couple of years ago when Mike Pence, right, with the vice president was being blasted on the news because he, uh, because he wouldn't uh, go out alone with, with a female and, uh, who, who isn't his wife. And I just sit there and I was like, why is this causing such a stir, right? Why is this causing such a... Um, why is this causing such havoc, right? It seems to me that's a good thing, right? He's, she's, uh, in ministry, we call that the Billy Graham role, right? Where Billy Graham wouldn't go out with someone, right? Because he was trying to avoid the temptation and also trying to, to avoid the, the appearance of cheating on his wife. And Mike Pence follows this exact same role. And yet here he is, he's getting blasted over this because, right, he's following a role, which to me seems perfectly fine, right? Now, obviously, you know, and there are all kinds of nuances and I've had conversations on that about it, but ultimately it seems like and this is a guy who's trying to do what's right, right? And the world is blasting him over it. And so, so just be aware that even in this world when we're trying to do right, that this world will look for ways, right, to slander us about our actions as we're trying to follow Jesus. Now, let's move on as we wrap this up. It says, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. It says that ultimately, while they're 
slandering these good deeds, that they are watching you. And as they're observing you, that hopefully one day they will give glory to God on the day of his return. See, our deeds actually can lead people when coupled with the gospel to Jesus. I don't believe, right, that we're to be people who say, just look at our lives and then, right, hopefully someone will watch me and that will lead them to the Lord. We must speak the gospel. But as we're speaking the gospel, we must make sure that our deeds and our actions are aligning with the things that we are saying and that the good news that we're saying can change their life actually has evidence in your life and my life as a life changed by the good news. Now, if they want to slander us, if they want to call us hypocrites, as, as we're called with these early Anabaptists, that's perfectly fine. That's prerogative. But keep the faith, keep the hope, knowing, right, that they may, that they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. That when the chips are down, they can say, you know, Tad, or whoever, whatever your name is, I saw them living good deeds, right? Their actions match their words. Their hope matched their life. And so one day they could glorify God as well as they believe in him and in his son, Jesus Christ. And so it's the hope that we live in this world. It's our actions are very important, but it's also just an incredible uh, reminder to us as believers to walk in this world, but walk differently from the world so that our light and our salt that we, that we throw, uh, right, um, as Jesus would say in, in the Sermon on the Mount, would lead others to glorify our Father in heaven. So we, we uh, would hope that you have a great week. Like I said, there is tons in this passage. There's tons more, right, that, that we could even look at and spend on. Uh, but we're just going to leave it here and hope you guys are conversating and talking about what it's like to be the salt and the light, what it's like to be aliens and strangers in this world, and what it's like in your context and in your life to live this hope for the world to see. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you again next Sunday.